G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy and in today's video we are going to be looking retrospectively at my 2020 AFL predictions that I did at the start of the season right before this COVID business hit. So that probably is a little bit of a disclaimer there. This was before COVID hit so anything that I got wrong I have an excuse for. Just kidding of course, in today's video I'm going to be watching back my predictions and my explanations for them and reacting to them and seeing just how off the mark I was. So without further ado, let's get into the video starting at the bottom and going up to first and then the predicted grand final. In 18th spot, I am predicting the Gold Coast Suns. Now, to be honest with you, I've got a bit of a gut feel about Gold Coast that they're probably actually going to avoid the spoon this year. But if I'm looking at it logically on paper, it's hard to justify any team below them. So frankly, I just think with the talent that they've got, they're in a better position than in previous years. But it's going to be a similar story where they might start the season well, jag a few wins, but I think with all the youth on their list and lack of experienced players, it's going to be a similar story of not being able to play a full season. Okay, so straight off the bat, not the best call, not a really controversial call. Obviously, a lot of people would have predicted Gold Coast to finish last this year. What I didn't predict was that they had several amazing performances in them, probably the highlight of which was against my team where they absolutely belted the Eagles in round two, and that momentum sort of staved off any real threat of a wooden spoon. I did kind of call it correctly when I said that they would drop off later in the season due to fatigue. That is more or less what happened. Uh, a few injuries as well, particularly to Matty Rao, that kind of ended just as it was starting to get good. I was about three or four spots off for the Gold Coast Suns. The reasoning was fairly okay, but obviously I undersold what they were capable of quite a lot. 17th spot. I've actually gone the Adelaide Crows this time, and my logic for that is uh, they their top-end talent I just don't think is extremely strong. It's solid. They've still got some decent plays in there. They've cleared away heaps of their second tier to other clubs and they cleared out their dead wood. Clearly preparing for a rebuild. They've put in a lot of youth into the list uh, and as a result, I think they're going to try and sort of pump games into the youth, experiment with a few new things. Got a new coach, so there's less pressure to perform. All right, so pretty much got it bang on with the Adelaide Crows pick. I correctly identified that they were clearing out their list, moving on some dead wood, and starting to push games into the youth, which ultimately was going to lead to a low finish on the ladder. The only thing I got wrong was that I thought Gold Coast were going to be even worse, but that wasn't the case. Adelaide won the wooden spoon, and I'll give myself a little bit of a tick for that prediction. And that leads me to 16th spot, the Sydney Swans. They've got extremely good top-end talent. You start with Buddy Franklin, probably a top five or six player in the competition and then you guys got, got guys like Heaney, Parker, Josh Kennedy, Rampy, and there's pretty good top-end talent. But then after that, the reliance is pretty strong on some quite young players. And while I do think they have some of the best youth in the comp, I just don't think it'll translate in enough wins to avoid the bottom four. All right, so it's going so far, so good with the Sydney Swans. Got that bang on. That's exactly where they finished. I identified that they are a top-heavy list with some of their best players, sort of shouldering a lot of the burden. And obviously, a lot of those players didn't get on the park this year. Kennedy missed football. Heaney missed football. Buddy Franklin didn't play a game. And as such, they'd rely a lot on their youth. And it didn't translate in wins. So, boom goes the dynamite. <laughs> so, pretty happy with that call. Let's move on. To round out the bottom four, I've got Carlton, and I know this one will be unpopular as well, but frankly, I agree with, I think it was Lee Matthews who said he thinks they're closer to the bottom four than the top eight. There's good youth on the list, but I don't think they're quite at that age where they're going to take the next step, and they're going to start the year without Kerno and Mackay, and eventually they'll get those players back, but I think there's that's an important avenue to goal that they've lost. All right, so with Carlton, I did definitely Definitely undersell them. That was actually quite a negative prediction on them. I think it was mostly in response to the fact that people were expecting them to push for finals. And the answer was somewhere in the middle. They finished in 11th spot, which is significantly better than the 15th I predicted. And they're a lot more relevant to that finals race than I expected. Although ultimately, they still prove not really a true top eight contender. Overall, I'm happy to admit that I probably undersold Carlton quite a bit there. In 14th spot, I am going with Fremantle. And this is a team that I usually try and make a case for finishing higher because I think they're underrated in terms of what they can produce when they've got a fully fit available list. But the downside this year is that they don't really have a very available list. Some important players are missing. They've got Fife and Walters, but in the absence of Pierce and Hamling and Nathan Wilson, Jesse Hogan's unavailable. Ed Langdon, Brad Hill have left the club. It's similar to Adelaide, they've got a new coach, maybe under a little less pressure. All right, so Fremantle ended up finishing 12th, not 14th, so they kind of exceeded my expectations in a way. I did identify that they didn't have good availability through the preseason, and you know, a lot of their key players were injured, which just so often the case for Fremantle. And where I probably undersold them was guys like Brayshaw, Chera, and someone even like Caleb Sarong, 
coming in and playing to such a good standard. I didn't think any of those guys were going to be quite as good this year as they were, and that's probably ultimately the difference with them. Next up, I've got St. Kilda, who I really wanted to put higher in this ladder prediction, but frankly, I'd be disingenuous because I just don't really rate their best 22 quite enough. Now, they, there is a lot of cases to be made for them moving up the ladder. They've got a better injury list than last year. In fact, it's a perfect injury list at the moment. Last year, they obviously had one of the worst in the league. The fact that they've added to their list, and um, even though they lost a few players, they brought more in. There was a net positive there. I just don't think their best 22 can compete quite on the same level as those teams really gunning for those top six to eight positions. Hmm... Rats. Okay, that is my first absolute stinker call. Saints obviously finished sixth and won a final in their first full season under Brett Ratton in a massively successful season, it has to be said. I did identify the a couple of key variables for them was going to be the availability. They had a good injury run, and I also acknowledged that they had recruited a lot of key best 22 players as well, despite losing some. Unfortunately, though, in my mind, that wasn't going to be enough to lift them into finals contention, and I got that completely wrong. So... Credit to you, St. Kilda. Well done on a great season. North are a team that I couldn't really make a strong case for moving up or moving down the ladder. I do rate their youth. They've also got some very good experienced players, but I think they kind of still earn that glut where they, they rely on their experienced players a little bit too much and the young players need to come through and shoulder more of the load. You've got Ben Brown in there already playing to an elite standard. Robbie Tarrant in the midfield in particular, they rely heavily on Cunnington and Higgins. And now it's time for guys like LDU, Bonar, Simpkin, and the, and the rest to really stand up. All right, again, not a great call on North Melbourne who ended up finishing bottom two after a pretty horrific year. I think the points I touched on there were all fairly good. A lot of their mature players should have played better this year than they actually did. In particular, Ben Brown. That was an absolute stinker of a call by me. But I can't help but feel a little bit let down here by North Melbourne. I think they played well below their expectations. I think that's evidenced by the fact that Reshaw, before he moved on, made some major changes to the list and a lot of changes coming at North. So there'll be an interesting one to watch in the coming seasons. In 11th spot, I've got Porter Adelaide and they're an enigmatic team. I think this will spell the end for Ken Hinckley as coach. Coach. It might not even last a full season if they have a bad start to the year. But while I do sort of rate their, their mature players, they're nothing really special to write home about. Sorry, Anthony. But their youth is really exciting. Obviously, Connor Rosie, one of the best elite talents going in the competition under that sort of under-21 range. So they've got a lot to look forward to. I think they'll probably have to push some games into those younger guys. And as a result, I expect them to be inconsistent. And they're kind of already the embodiment of inconsistency already. Oh, that was kind of scathing on Port Adelaide. Probably an even worse call than St. Kilda 1. I didn't rate Port Adelaide's ability to find that consistency that they so sorely lacked and push up all the way. And in fact, they had an amazing season going 14-3, and three, which to be fair, very few people would have predicted. What I definitely did was undersold the quality of their senior players. Someone like a Travis Boak finishing, what was it? I think he finished outright second in the Brownlow at the end of it. Charlie Dixon had one of the seasons of his life. Robbie Gray was in his peak form. Tom Jonas was really good down back. And in addition to that, they have some outstanding youth and they, you know, they played Queensland really well. They had a great season. Again, I did acknowledge that they had the ability to beat some quality teams. So again, the question is going forward, can they do it in future seasons? We will see. Next up is the hardest team team in the league to place this season. I've got Melbourne finishing 10th. What I think will happen is that they'll start to regain their confidence over the course of the season. They're going to be inconsistent. A lot of their improvement will be driven from young guys starting to hit their prime like Petrarca and Brayshaw, Clayton, Oliver. Long story short, I think Melbourne are going to be all over the place this season and it won't be enough to jag a final spot. I've got them finishing 10th. You know what? I'm pretty happy with that call. Melbourne ended up finishing 9th and just missing out on the finals. And you know what? They were all over the place this season. They had some horrific losses, some fantastic wins, and they got a lot of good quality football out of this, some some of the young players, in particular Christian Petrarca, who I named. Well, I'd love to take a whole heap of credit for that, though. I must say it was kind of a stab in the dark. Melbourne genuinely were one of the hardest teams to predict this year, and I kind of just picked their midpoint for where I thought they could finish, and that's exactly what happened. In ninth spot, I've got Essendon narrowly missing the finals. They're undoubtedly injury struck at the moment with some key players missing and not getting a proper preseason, which may affect them down the road. And while we know on their day they are a very good team, I think over the course of the season, for a start, they're an inconsistent team, but if they've got key players without a preseason, um, I think there's a case to be made that they might just not quite hit the same heights as last year. 
All right, so I had Essendon in ninth, missing the finals due to injury and inconsistency. And in reality, they finished 13th due to injury and inconsistency. Look, while I was four spots off with that, I'm fairly happy with that prediction. I think I hit most of the important touching points. They went into the season with a lack of availability, and I knew that that was going to have a debilitating effect on them over the course of the season. That's what happened. I didn't quite predict just how much they would drop off later in the season. I think 13th is probably not a great reflection on how good they actually are. So not to toot my horn too much, I think that is actually a fairly sound prediction, despite the fact that I was four places off. In eighth spot, I've got the Hawks returning to a top eight spot with some key ins in uh, Sam Frost and John Patton helping them structurally. I know they're not necessarily amazing players, but that will help. Obviously, Tom Mitchell coming back to the side. The mix there is quite dangerous. They've got a very proficient forward line. I think their best 22 is strong, yet to be convinced about the depth of their maybe 22 to 30 range, and that's why I don't have them higher. But I think Hawthorne is certainly good enough to play finals again this season. All right, so that is another pretty horrible call. I tipped Hawthorne to finish in the top eight and they ended up going into the bottom four. But I'll, I will defend that one as well, thinking that Hawthorne probably has horribly underachieved again. What I acknowledged was that their best 22 was strong. Thought at the end of 2019, the Hawks probably slightly underachieved by missing the finals, considering they finished top four the previous year. And I probably overrated the impact that Tom Mitchell returning was gonna have. There's definitely a bit of talent to work with on the Hawks list, both young and mature predominantly mature. I don't really know what to predict for them going forward, what it's going to look like, but either way, I was a fair way off that. In seventh spot, I've got the Geelong Cats sliding from first to seventh, and then they're a popular one. Feel a bit dirty, just sort of just hopping on the bandwagon, but the case to be made for them dropping down a little bit is strong. Tim Kelly leaving is probably the biggest factor in all that. Got a big push on youth. Last year, they took many draft picks. I think they took six in the first 45. When a team's doing that, it usually indicates that they want to sort of give games to the youth as well. Now, I certainly don't think that Geelong are going to start rebuilding and playing the kids every week, but it suddenly means you replace a Tim Kelly with someone like a Cooper Stevens, and I just don't think Geelong, with all the other aging players, will be quite up to their standards of last year's. God damn it, why does Geelong do this to me every single year? Look, I acknowledge I really didn't want to be one of those bandwagon people that picks the oldest team or one of the oldest teams to slide down the ladder, but I thought the logic with that was fair with Tim Kelly departing the club and only Jack Steven really coming in as a mature measure. Look, the Cats were one of the best teams this year, arguably the best team for a long period of it, and last year, unlucky not to make the grand final as well. They've been a fantastic club, and to lose one of their best performers and then also back it up by making the grand final that following year is a ridiculous achievement. Fair to say I undersold them, and I will definitely not be doing that next year, especially if they land Jeremy Cameron. Next, I have the other half of last year's top two, the Brisbane Lions. Essentially, I just think with a little bit more opportunity position analysis on them now. Everyone's sort of worked them out a little bit, or at least they've had the chance to. Harder fix to this season. At the moment, they're very fit and healthy, which is a great start. So if that stays the case, that stays the case they can probably win enough games to jag a top four spot. I expect them to be a play a similar sort of standard as last year, but I just don't have them quite as good as the other teams we're about to go through. Yep, again, undersold Brisbane Lions. Being a young team, I expected them to have a non-linear kind of improvement to finish second and go out in straight sets. I thought there's no way they'll back that up again, but they pretty much did and were equally as good this year, if not better, in 2020. Now, part of that, it does help that they didn't travel all year, and admittedly, I know they didn't play every game at the Gabba. Like, they played most of their games at Metricon. It still would have had a small factor, but that being said, they were easily one of the best four teams by the end of the season, and they really impressed me with the way they played, particularly in that first final, not so much the second one. As it turns out, they've got two more years of finals experience under their belt and they're well poised for an assault on the flag for probably the next five years. In fifth spot, I have got Collingwood and for where Collingwood have been in the last couple of seasons, finishing fifth would probably be considered a bit of a failure. Look, there's not too much to report on in terms of changes at Collingwood. They've had a couple of quiet off seasons in a row. Their big recruit from a couple of years ago, Dane Beans, may not play football again. I just think they're going to slide out of the top four and be leapfrogged by the team. I'm about to mention. So I thought putting Collingwood at fifth was doing them a little bit dirty and would have been a massive failure considering their previous two seasons. And they ended up finishing fifth. Look, not too dirty on that prediction. I think Collingwood is well and truly in the top five or six best teams in the comp, but had a little bit of adversity this year with, uh, you know, on and off the field, I guess, with injuries. Don't think they coped well with the hubs. I think we saw the quality side that Collingwood really is in that first final when they knocked off West Coast in what was a 
fairly good standard of football. For me, without looking too much at the list changes that's going to take place at that club, I'd be very surprised if they're not a contender yet again in 2021. But this year will just be a bit of a write-off for them. In fourth spot, I have got everyone's favorite dark horse this year, the Western Bulldogs. They're a tricky one for me because they're another side that has been horribly inconsistent, even in the year they won the flag. And I just think at the where their list is at in terms of the age profile, guys like Bont, Dunkley, McRae, and Hunter, they're all actually reaching their prime now, similar to sort of what's happening at GWS. This year is the year they finally actually assert themselves as a top four team. Look, I wasn't actually too far off the mark with that one. They finished seventh, but I probably oversold the fact that I thought this was their time to shine. This was the year the mature midfielders were ready to go push for that flag, but we did see a few problems unfolding at the Dogs. I think the biggest thing for them was, you know, a lack of goal scoring Paris, particularly early in the season. Norton was underdone and he was injured. They were over-reliant on their midfield, even with these guys playing fairly well. I think the biggest tipping point for me was when they faced St Kilda in the final, and despite being the more experienced team, where I really thought that would come to shine and beat St Kilda, who most of those guys hadn't played in a final before. Instead, they got undone, admittedly, in a close game. But I thought that was a bit of a failure for the Dogs, and they'll probably look back on this season as a bit of a missed opportunity. In third spot, I've got the West Coast Eagles. The list is very strong. They're strong across all lines. Josh Kennedy's probably going to improve big on last year, where he, well, he hasn't really been fit for three years, and it, I think it took his toll on him. Like any other team, they're going to rely on a bit of luck. 15-7 and seven last year got them fifth, but in previous years, it's gotten teams not the minor premiership. So we'll just have to wait and see on the Eagles. I think they're as good as just about anyone. Obviously, a couple of instances last year where they dropped their bundle a little bit and let opportunities slip. So not the absolute worst call on the Eagles there. Obviously, they ended up finishing fifth. I did identify Kennedy was in great shape in the preseason and the first half of his year was actually very good. The Eagles were a bit of a weird one this year. They had a horrible first hub, an average second hub, but they also had a lot of injuries in there. And then between that, they went 7-0 and in Perth. They were pretty much one controversial touch goal review away from actually finishing the top four anyway. So this call wasn't particularly bad. That being said, even though they probably could have finished fifth, they would have displaced Geelong. And I think Geelong were the better team this year anyway. So maybe a slight overrating of the Eagles this year. In second spot, I've got the Richmond Tigers. Now they have lost a couple of depth players, two or three depth players, but overall I don't think it's going to affect them too much. Last year they copped probably the worst injury run they have in a number of years and they still won the bloody flag and played amazing football. I still think they're the team to beat. Yeah, look, pretty good call that one. They ended up finishing third in the home and away season, not second where I predicted, but ultimately identified them as the team to beat. Not too much more needs to be said about that. GWS Giants I'm going to take home the minor premiership this year. Now, GWS are obviously probably the most talented list in the competition, but what they've lacked is that real killer edge, I think, that teams like Richmond and West Coast in previous years have had. It was only until the finals last year where we saw GWS play like an actual champion team. To that point, they just had a lot of promise. Can they take that into next year? I probably will back them in to do it. Obviously, the counter-argument is most teams who get belted in a grand final don't back it up with a good season the following year. Ah, rats. Again, another stinker of a call, but again, I feel a little bit let down by the fact that the Giants played nowhere near their potential this year. I don't know exactly what happened. I know that Stephen Canelio, the captain, sort of fell out of favor. He ended up getting dropped. It was just a bit of turmoil at the Giants, which ultimately led to them missing out on finals altogether. For them, they're too talented a list to miss out on finals again next year, in my opinion. So I'm just going to put this down to a bad year. Even if they lose Jeremy Cameron, they still have one of the most talented lists in the comp. I'm going to say Richmond face off with West Coast in the grand final of the MCG. I'm going to say Richmond take home the premiership again, beating my beloved Eagles in the grand final. I hope that doesn't happen, but that, I will make that my prediction. Okay, damn. So again, overrated my Eagles a little bit there. I thought with the addition of Tim Kelly, they were going to be good enough to play off in a grand final. But I got it half right. I ended up tipping correctly that Richmond would win the grand final in 2020. Brownlow medal, I'm going to say Bontempelli wins his first medal. Common medal's tough. I think it's out of a few people. I think I said Ben Brown in the video the other day, so I'll just go with that. Obviously, that depends on North and how well they play this season. The Rising Star, honestly, I think it's probably going to be Matt Rowe, but I am going to go a little bit different. Don't want to pick the boring option. I'm going to back in my boy Dylan Stevens to take that home. Now, obviously, the Brownlow medal, Lockie Neal won by some distance, so I was a bit off the mark with Bont, but I do think it's just a matter of time before he does win one. The Coleman medal was an absolute stinker of a call. Ben Brown really pulled out the worst season of his career, and while I think he has plenty to offer still at the highest level, 
he really let me down with 2020. Rising Star can always be a little tough one to predict. I did predict Matt Rowell in theory, and obviously he got injured, so I'm glad I hedged and decided to go with Dylan Stevens as well. I don't think anyone really saw Caleb Sarong becoming a dominant inside mid in his first season as well, so that was quite hard to predict, and Dylan Stevens didn't quite get any momentum going by comparison at Sydney, although I think he'll be a very good player. Anyway, guys, that is all for my predictions. I think I did fairly solidly there. The start of season predictions are very, very difficult to pull off, and ultimately, I got the right premier in the end, so I'll pat myself on the back for that. But, of course, as always, there was a heap of stingers. Misread completely the Saints. Port Adelaide and GWS in particular. That is the way with predictions. You're never going to get it completely right, so there's no point getting too caught up in it. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you did, and also subscribe if you're new to the channel. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.